Whitehall, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 comes from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Chief Superintendent John Davidson will brief you on this case, number 381-397. Good afternoon. This Gladstone bag is one of my exhibits in the Black Museum back there. A perfectly ordinary black Gladstone bag, vintage, I should say, of 1920. Now, it doesn't unlock any longer. The lock has been forced. But it can be opened. Now, you can guess for yourself what those stains are. You see, they're both on the lining of the bag and on this tennis racket cover, which has been in the bag since Easter weekend of 1924. And now, if you please, here is Inspector Rafe Sylvester who I think will tell you how this bag came into our possession here at Scotland Yard's Black Museum. I could supply the answer quite simply and quickly, sir. Yeah, I know that one, old boy. The owner had no further use for it. The owner had no further use for anything, sir, except the services of Pierpoint the hangman. Robert Emmett Dignam worked very hard at being a hail fellow well met. He was a dapper man, a, a persuasive talker, and thus an excellent salesman, despite the fact that he was only five feet two inches tall. Dignam's wife, Olivia, who worked as a contomitum uh, operator at a salary of three pounds a week, entertained certain suspicions of her husband, due largely to his undeniable attraction for other women, particularly tall women. She herself was an inch shorter than her husband, a scant five foot one in height. One day when Robert Emmett Dignam had returned home to Kew from a weekend trip to Manchester, he'd said, on business, Olivia Dignam came across a cloakroom ticket from Waterloo Station in the pocket of the suit he had worn. She asked an old friend of hers, Herbert Chin, for advice. Chin, who had been a detective sergeant of the Metropolitan Police, took the ticket and went to the Waterloo Station cloakroom to see what was what. He was not a particular friend of Robert Emmett Dignam, and then he came to see me at Scotland Yard. Oh, I turned in the ticket and the man handed me a bag, a black Gladstone bag. It was locked? Locked, yes. But I was able to pull the sides apart a bit. Uh, so you could see what was in it? Yes. What was? It was empty. Mm -hmm. Except for some pieces of silk, what looked like a tennis racket case and a large knife. Well, that's an odd combination, I agree, but... Well, I'll take my oath. They were all stained with blood. <laughs> Chin gave me the ticket, which he had got back when he returned the bag to the cloakroom shelves. I took it and went to see for myself. I, I took one of the pieces of silk and sent it to the laboratory to be tested. Back came the report. Human blood. I put two detectives on a 24 hours a day watch of the cloakroom. At nine o'clock the next morning, they brought him in and left him in my office. I asked him his name. Robert Emmett Dignam, Inspector. <laughs> named after the great Irish patriot, you know. Uh, this your bag, Mr. Dignam? Well, I paid for it. Is it yours? Uh, yes, sir. I left it in... Uh... Uh, you know what's in it? What I'd love to know is how it came to be here. You left the ticket for it in a pocket of your green suit. Oh. My beloved wife goes through my pockets. She does, sir. At least she did in this instance. She wants a thrashing, doesn't she? I shouldn't let a constable catch you at it. I shan't, thank you. I ask you if you know what's in your bag, sir. Nothing very important. Shall we look? Um, will you unlock it? These things yours? Well, that's my tennis racket case. Your name is Dignam, you said? Yes. 
Initials on it are I J M. Eh? Not yours, are they? I bought it from a friend several years ago. Hmm. These pieces of silk and this knife. Cook's knife, big one. I must have picked it up at the bungalow. Are these stains, Mr. Dignam, can you explain them too? Oh. Why, well, I'm very fond of dogs. Dogs? Uh, yes, I was carrying some dog meat in the bag. Oh, o- odd place to carry it, I know. <laughs> I had it all wrapped up in these bits of silk. That's where the stains came from, old boy. What sort of meat was it? Oh, oh they were kind of meat, um, you know, dog... Beef or, or horse meat, perhaps. Oh, yeah, probably horse meat, I fancy. That blood is from the meat? Oh, of mm. course, I, I said... It uh, was human blood that caused those stains, Mr. Dignam. I should be glad to hear your explanation of that, sir. Well, all I can say is that it was dog's meat. What kind of dogs do you have, sir? Oh, I haven't got any... I I mean... (laughs) What do you find so amusing, sir? (laughs) All this is making me sound quite like a murderer, isn't it? Mr. Dignam, I must detain you on suspicion of murder. Look here. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. If you have anything to say now, I'll be glad to hear it. Well, well, I'll have to think about that. Mr. Dignam thought. He thought for a long time. Sitting in my office, tearing out of the window at the rain. Ten minutes went by. I looked at him. I've got to get some things straight in my mind. Uh, Take your time, Mr. Dignam, I said. He sighed, asked for a drink of water, drank it thirstily, and returned to his tearing out the window. Another 15 minutes went by. (coughs) Speaking to me, Mr. Dignam, I asked. I suppose you know all about this, don't you? I've no intention of telling you what we know, Mr. Dignam. It's for you to tell us if you want to. You've been warned. What? That anything you say may be used in evidence. Yes. Well... It isn't murder. What are you writing down? What you've just said. Oh. Well, it isn't murder. I've been very foolish, perhaps. Write that down, too. Uh? I'll make a statement now. I've got it all straight, what to say. When you are ready, Mr. Dignam. I do not know who this fellow was. This man. I'd gone for a weekend's rest to the bungalow. I've been very exhausted. I worked very hard, you understand, and I felt the need for a rest. Alone. All by myself. To recuperate, to regain my strength. I didn't tell my wife or anyone where I was going. I wanted no interruptions, you understand, either uh, business or domestic. Are you getting all that? Yes. I had come across this place in my travels... A capital place to be alone, I thought at once. To rest, to refresh myself, I thought at once. A genuine deserted cottage on the deserted seashore. I told no one about my plans. I I took only just a few articles of clothing. Uh, And, of course, the tennis racket. The tennis racket you refer to is the one that was in the case marked with the initials IJM. Eh? Uh, That's the one. Uh, The one I bought from someone several years ago. I went to this place alone and settled down for the evening. About midnight, I was awakened from a sound sleep uh, by a sound. Uh, Shall I go slower? Thank you, I'm getting it all right. A man, a tramp by his appearance, I have no clue whatever to his identity, burst into my room. He told me he wanted my money. I leaped out of bed and, seeing he was much larger than I, started to retreat. He seized an axe. An axe? Uh, It was used for chopping up firewood, and he threw it at me. He attacked me first. Got that? Yes. The axe rebounded from the wall, and the handle was broken. Then, despite the difference in our sizes, I grappled with him. He slipped and fell, his head striking the edge of a large coal scuttle alongside the fireplace. He did not get up. To my horror... I discovered he was dead. 
Have you got that? Yes. I'm afraid I lost my head. I carried the body into the other room. Then I think I fainted. When I recovered consciousness, I was horrified to find the body still on the couch where I had placed it. Then I made my greatest mistake. I was panicky. I thought I might be accused of murder. <coughs> my first thought was to dispose of the body. Do you know what I did? No. I first tried to burn the body in the fireplace. The clothes caught on fire, but I grew more frightened. I put on a coat and I walked to Eastbourne where I bought the large knife, uh, the one in the bag. I came back and then when I got I back will into the spare cottage, you I the rest the of floor. Robert Emmett Dignam's gruesome story. Except for the curious commentary Herbert Chin, the friend of Mrs. Dignam's no maid on the case. The man was Dignam was concluding his statement when the telephone rang. I'm a fool. Excuse me. Inspector Sylvester here. Herbert Chin here. Oh, oh, how do you do? I take it you got him. Hmm? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I saw his wife. I told her it was his raincoat Dignam had left at the Waterloo cloakroom, but, but she won't be satisfied. Oh? Well, she's sure it's something to do with some woman he's been chasing. Has it turned out that way? I mean, is it permissible to ask you that? Turns out quite different, it seems, tell her. Well, she'll be glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, she keeps insisting this man and girl is involved in it somehow. Oh, she'll be very glad. Uh, what, uh, what was that name? Manning. Orange Josephine Manning, that's her full name, I believe. I looked over at the initials on the tennis racket case in the black Gladstone bag. I.J.M. Irene Josephine Manning. So that was the name of the former owner. Was it also the name of... Go on, Mr. Dignam, I said. I didn't mention the name of Irene Josephine Manning to Dignam at this time. Rather, I sat and squirmed with impatience while they told me more details of the place where the alleged tramp had been accidentally killed. It was at a place called the Crumbles, a long stretch of shingle on Pevensey Bay near Eastbourne in East Sussex. Shingle, as you Americans perhaps do not know, is a... Well, it's a kind of pebbly, rocky beach, very unpleasant underfoot. The Crumbles is as desolate a spot as can be found on the southeast coast. Windy and dreary, deserted by nearly all human life. The cottage where the tragedy had occurred, Digdom told me, bore the quaint name of um, the officer's house, part of a former coast guard station. And Dignam had rented it from a Mr. Saul Brainerd. When Dignam had finished his statement, he was tucked into a cell at Cannon Row Police Station, and I motored to Eastbourne to interview Mr. Brainerd. I'm Brainerd, Inspector. What have I done now? You've rented a house, Mr. Brainerd. <laughs> well, I suppose it was a crime to charge three and a half guineas a week for that place. <laughs> oh, I'll go along peacefully. Uh, you did rent it to Mr. Dignam, then? Dignam? I told him his name was Plunkett. Old Irish family, he said. Related to Lord Dunsany. Little bit of a chap. Mm. Recognize him again, would you? Oh, he's unmistakable. Cocky little beggar. Paid up, of course. Oh, for two more weeks. Well, that's why I haven't been around there. Said he liked privacy, and I'm no trespasser, though I am a landlord. I wonder when you saw him last. Well, I saw him and his wife come in. I was cycling by. He, he didn't see you? Well, I don't think so. He was up there on the road. His wife? Oh, great tour girl. Sure it wasn't another man you saw? Oh, great mop of blonde hair blowing in the wind. We've no long-haired men around here. Leave that for London. Hmm. Besides, he did mention his wife to me when he rented the place, seems to me. Well, when was that? Oh, Saturday evening. Late afternoon, rather. Why, what's up? Haven't seen him since? Or her? Haven't been around. Said he was looking for privacy, as I said. Yes, yes, I expect he was. A good place for it. Yes. Would you come to London and see if you recognize him? Isn't he here? No. I, I sell, chap. What's up? Things. Uh, would you? Well, the affair to London... Oh, the home office will pay him. Well, in that case, the answer's yes. Well, won't mind if I go round to my tailor's whilst I'm there, will you? Not at all, if you'll come. Say no more. I'm your man for a free trip to London. 
Oh, what else can I do for you? A spot of whiskey? A, a cup of tea? Thanks. Uh, just let me use your keys to get in the place. I, I shall let you in. I doubt she's there. Oh, I don't know if I should let you in, old boy, after all. I've got a search warrant. Oh, something is out there. Uh, what are you looking for? Proceeds of a bank robbery? <laughs> well, hardly, hardly a robbery. Oh, you won't talk, eh? Well, look, the big one here is for the front door. This one? Oh, well, all the others are for various rooms. Mm -hmm. They're labeled, see? Sure you won't need any help, then? No, no, thanks. I'd like to go back to London with me today. We'll catch the up train at 4.30, shall we? Oh, righty-ho. Righty-ho. <laughs> well, thanks, old chap. I'll see you later. I walked over to the dismal little walled house. It had a dank look. I glanced over my shoulder. Brainerd was still watching me. I walked through the gate in the wall, and I couldn't see him any longer. Up to the house. The sound of the sea. The smell of the sea. And then another smell. I remembered the time the sergeant cook at Naughty Ash Rest Camp in Southampton had let a pork roast catch on fire, and we went for our dinner. I felt like... Well, never mind. I unlocked the door and opened it. I walked in. There was the fireplace choked with ashes. There was the coal scuttle. He said the tramp cracked his head on fatally. Tin. Crumpled tin. There was the axe. The axe, he said, had been thrown at him. The handle was broken. Exactly the way he said it was. Blood stains. I thought they were on the floor. What's that? White thread. Looks like a long blonde hair. Huh. Let's keep that. What's in the other room? What's that? Leather heel. High heel. Of a woman's dark blue shoe. What's that? Bloodstains. And here, too. And the tramp died when he struck his head on the coal scuttle out there. Mm hmm. Let's review it all again, I thought to myself. The broken axe handle. Check. The crumpled coal scuttle. Might be. I doubt it. The woman's high heel. Maybe. The woman, the wife that Brainerd saw. The knife, he said he bought it in Eastbourne. Who's that? Brainerd. <laughs> Did I interrupt you, Inspector? Come on, the London train's due in 20 minutes and we've just got time. I don't want to miss the free trip to the city, old man. <laughs> We caught the next train. Just caught it, as a matter of fact, because I had to stop at all the ironmonger shops in Eastbourne to inquire about a cook's knife. I deposited Brainerd at the West End Hotel and went home for a night's sleep. Seven o'clock the next morning. I called Alfred Ormerod, the home office pathologist at home. He was annoyed. It better be important, Sylvester. I've got lather all over my face. Well, take my word for it, Alfred. But take your word for what, man? It's important. Well, 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 go ahead. My face itches. Can you tell the difference between a man's body and a woman's? Are you daft? When they've been destroyed by fire? I repeat my question. Have you taken leave of your senses, Sylvester? What's the answer? No. Now, look, my face feels Will like... you come to the office at the yard at once, please? I'll be there at half past nine. Not a second earlier. But look... I suggest that you go shave yourself, Inspector. I'll see you at 9.30. Good morning. 
Well, that's that. Oh. Inspector Sylvester, him. Oh, uh, Chin. Herbert Chin here, Sylvester. I've been trying to get you, but your telephone's been busy. Where you what? Well, look here, about, about this chap Dignam. What about him? Oh, you remember I mentioned that girl, that Irene Manning, to you yesterday? The girl he was chasing after? Yes. Yeah. Well, look here, she's disappeared. How do you know? Well, her sister. Her sister, Julie Manning, she's at Mrs. Dignam's home right now, screaming for Dignam's blood. Oh? She says her sister's been missing since Saturday afternoon, and she's certain she's gone away with Dignam. Dignam's in Cannon Row Police Station. Oh, but where's Irene Manning? Is this sister with Mrs. Dignam now? Yes. Can you bring her to my office at Scotland Yard at once? Well, I'll try. I'll be there in less than half an hour. Goodbye. Uh, but... Now, where are my trousers? Oh... Yes, Inspector Sylvester here. Cannon Row Police Station here, sir. Sorry to bother you this hour, sir, but... What's the matter? This prisoner of yours, uh, Dignam. What's wrong with him? Oh, he's been raising all kinds of canes. Uh, says he wants to see you at once. Says it's extremely important. Well, sir. send him over to my office at the yard with a couple of men. I'll see him. Is he dangerous, sir? He is. How soon do you want him, sir? I'll be there in 20 minutes, I hope. Thank you, sir. I'll be glad to get rid of him. Goodbye. Now, if that thing rings just once more... But it didn't. I got to my office at New Scotland Yard, still adjusting my braces. I glanced at the clock. It was five minutes before eight. In the waiting room, Herbert Chin sat beside a tall, blonde girl. I'll see you in a moment, I muttered, and went on into my office. There was Robert Emmett Dignam, flanked by two large constables. He jumped up when he saw me. There you are at last. Well? Look here, I didn't murder anyone. So you said, Mr. Dignam. I, I mean, this tramp who attacked me with the axe fell and smashed his own head. That's all that happened. And uh, you disposed the body, you said. Well, I was uh, confused. I was frightened. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sorry. Well, you can't keep me in jail for that, you know. I'm afraid I can't do anything for you, Mr. Dignam. That's a matter for the magistrate. I'll get a writ of habeas corpus. Do you have anything to add to your statement of yesterday, Mr. Dignam? I told you everything. I have nothing to add. Well, when you have, I'll be glad to take it down in writing. Until then, I'm sorry. Listen to me, you. Now, listen, uh, I Take you, the I, little I, man I, away, I, Constable, I, I'm please. Gonna, you're not going to hang me. You're not going to... Let me... Herbert Chin came in with the tall blonde girl whom he introduced. This is uh, Miss Julie Manning, Inspector. <laughs> Sit down, Miss Manning. My sister's gone. Do you have any idea where she is, Miss Manning? Yes. That man Dignam murdered her. What makes you think that? Well, I, I really left him money and I know what he did with it. She thought he was speculating with it. He could make some more money for both of them. But he lost it on the races. How do you know that, Miss Manning? I really was the one that found it out. I know all about it. He promised to desert his wife and marry her. And he told her they'd go to South America when she accused him of spending every penny she'd saved. And... Well, that doesn't argue that he murdered her, Miss Manning. Then where is she? Tell me where she is if he didn't kill her. Now, Jolie, please. You then. keep quiet. I know where she went with him last Saturday. He told her to come to Eastbourne with Eastbourne? Him and... Yes. He told her he'd give her the money there at his cottage. And... Well, she told me about it. I told her she was a fool, but... She won't go and <laughs> he's murdered her. I tell you, he's robbed her of every penny she owned. And when she wasn't any more use to him, he took her away and, and murdered her. <laughs> he murdered her. She told him she'd have him arrested and put in prison for the rest of his life for stealing her money and he, he killed her. <laughs> oh. Poor, poor Irene. <laughs> he said he walked to the village and bought a knife after the tramp had died. The ironmonger in Eastbourne said a little man who was with a tall blonde woman had bought the heavy knife when they got off the train in Eastbourne. They laughed together about it, he said. He bought the knife before they went to the cottage. And they laughed together about it. Alfred Ormerod, the pathologist you remember, came in at half past nine. He left 
on the 10-3 for Eastbourne with his murder kit promising to telephone me. At 10.15, the landlord Brainerd came in. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late, but I've just been to the bank. Bank? That that fee Plunkett. Plunkett? Oh, oh, Dignam. Oh, whatever his name is. I just got a check back from the bank stamped R.D. My wife sent it to me from Eastbourne. No funds, the bank says. Uh, I had him hanged. I walked over to Cannon Row with Brainerd. He recognized Dignam at once as Plunkett, and the dapper little man was charged again, this time with obtaining money by false pretenses. He again pleaded with me. Even if the man died, even if I did dispose of the body, Inspector, they can't do anything to me for murder. Even if I killed him, it's manslaughter, isn't it? Justifiable homicide. It, it's self I'm sorry, Dignam. Perhaps Robert Emmett Dignam already felt the clammy touch of the hangman's hands on his neck. At four o'clock that afternoon, Alfred Ormerod telephoned me from Eastbourne. Hello, Sylvester. I've been working all day here at the cottage. I've never seen such a diabolical thing. All those ashes in the fireplace are human ashes. Yes, I can prove it. Although the ashes of the bones have apparently been crushed to powder. It's almost perfect destruction of a body. Yes, I've found the heel of a woman's slipper. That can be identified, I'm sure. I also found several other things. Traces of ashes have been carried out of the house. Two small pins. Hair clips, I think you call them, near the door. He was going to throw the ashes into the sea. Yes, I found it, too. It was snagged under a rock. At the water's edge. Yes. Two or three blonde hairs still adhere to it. I'm sure you can identify it by the teeth. A young woman, yes. And the marks on the back of them. On the back, just above the point where the neck joins it. Yes. It was crushed. No, it couldn't have been caused by a fall against the uh, coal scuttle. The scuttle's too flimsy. Besides... The wounds don't fit any part of the coal scuttle. They do fit the blade of the axe, though. Right. I'm afraid you're hanged. He did hang. When it was demonstrated in court that he had bought the knife before he enticed the girl to the cottage, they laughed over it together, the ironmonger said. When they fitted the axe into the wounds on what Alfred Ormerod proved was a young, blonde-haired girl's skull, when the whole sorry tale was told about his relations with Irene Manning and his fleecing of her money, then the jury said, Guilty. And dapper little Robert Emmett Dignam was hanged. You have just heard another in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled from the official files of Scotland Yard. The research is from Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. NBC.